Então, bom dia. E me convidar para abrir o congresso de uma dona Ondinha e eu falar em inglês e a minha língua de trabalho normalmente, ou misturar um pouco a minha língua nativa nos títulos dos livros que eu vou citar e a não, mas agora vou mudar para o inglês. E às vezes tem que fazer isso. Isso significa para ele E eu também te falei um handout. Let's talk English now. Uh, I, I prepared a handout which is not a bibliography. It is simply a list of the things that I will mention in this attempt of covering. 2,500 years of developments in 45 minutes, so that you don't have any trouble taking down those or so. I will pronounce, I will offer, it will also appear in brief forms on this very dull problem. I've never in my life given a dull problem without images, but this is it. What's time? It's just information so that you can follow some of the things I'm seeing, also visually. And uh, so whenever a new image is to, not image, text is to appear. So I'll do this now. Um, and I will start writing it a hello with the Künstler, translated into English as the mutual illumination of the arts. Was the title of a book published by the German literary scholar Oskar Balzen in 1917. Its subtitle has been rendered as a contribution to the appreciation of concepts of art history. Um, it signals the indebtedness of Balzen's thesis to the work of the art historian Heinrich Wölfling, his exact contemporary, whose Kunstgeschichte die Grundbegriffe, the basic concept of art history had appeared two years before. It was the title, as well as the argument, that made Balzer's work symptomatic of a tendency that began to assert itself in German academic circles at the beginning of the 20th century, when literary history had firmly established itself at universities, a scholarly discipline, followed by art history and finally by music history. <laughs> Wolfens was an attempt to give the scheme a solid methodological foundation. He proposed five antithetical pairs of basic concepts for contrasting high Renaissance and Baroque art. And the terms are here linear versus painterly, plain versus recession, closed versus open form, multiplicity versus unity, and absolute versus relative clarity of form. Walzer said that they could be fruitfully applied to the formal analysis of literary texts and not only the texts of the period studied by them. The German scholar Walzer not only referred to similar tendencies among his contemporaries to borrow terms and concepts used in the study of the other ones, but repeatedly quoted pronouncements by German romantic thinkers concerning artistic interrelations, and he also cited the saying attributed to the Greek philosopher Simonides of Chios, Simonides of Sias, who lived from 556 to 468 before the Christian era, that, quote, painting is new poetry, poetry is a speaking picture. And he thus, was, thus referred to the ancient history of a discourse that has linked painting and poetry as sister arts, as they came to be viewed in the 17th century. That discourse is best known under a phrase borrowed from the Augustan poet Horace's Ars Poetica, published 19 before the period of Christian era, the phrase Ut Pictora Poesis, mistakenly understood to mean as is painting, so is poetry. 
These two arts understood as practices were primarily seen as concerned with mimetic representation. Plato and Aristotle had explored that view many centuries later. Leonardo da Vinci had stylized it as a rivalry, a paragon, in which he had given painting the advantage. And it was still the concept that prompted Gottfried Kepler in Lessing's distinction in his La Hope of 1766 between sculpture and painting as spatial arts and poetry as a technical art. There is no comparable history dealing with the relations between music and poetry, or poetry or literature as we call it today. In the classical scheme of the seven liberal arts, music was one of the arts of the quadruvium, that is the upper four arts, as a mathematical art dealing with relations close to architecture. The arts of the basic trivium, the trivial arts, were concerned with the verbal of grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Rhetoric, the art of persuasion, then with the effects of speech on the listener. This interest also informed another aspect of theories concerning the visual arts, besides that of mimetic representation. And until the 18th century, issues of the effect on listeners were also crucial in theoretical discussions of music. But in that century, the 18th century, conceptions of the nature of the arts changed profoundly. A study published in 1749 by the fine arts reduced to one of the same principle, not only established the idea of thinking of the arts as comprising painting, sculpture, architecture, music, and poetry, but also suggested that there were common characteristics to art in general, no matter in what medium. Later in the century, the understanding of art, or of the arts, changed even more profoundly. Human needs, besides a healthy body, were now conceived as concerned with the true, the good, and the beautiful. Of the traditional schools of faculties at the university, medicine dealt with the body. Theology, the supreme faculty, was the true. Jurisprudence with the good, with right and wrong. Philosophy, already comprising the natural and humane sciences, now redeveloped a field that already had a tradition, that of aesthetics. Among the theories of the nature and function of beauty, developed by thinkers in England, France, and Germany, Immanuel Kant's 1719 study of aesthetic judgment was probably the most influential and helped to reconceive art in terms that are still familiar to us. Works of art came to be conceived as aesthetic objects, satisfying an innate aesthetic need. They possess a purposeful purposelessness as opposed to the product of the applied arts. Consequently, the artist assumed a new position in society and works in any of the arts were received as expressions of artistic sensibility. In Romanticism, music, the art least given to mimetic representation and rhetorical persuasion, and appealing more to feelings than to the rational mind, became a leading art. For over a century, one tendency among the arts in Europe was the aspiration to achieve the condition of music. The music of Hopkins shows, proclaimed Paul Verlaine at the opening of his Acquitique in 1874. At the same time, however, Romanticism spawned a counter tendency toward fusion of the arts, postulated by a number of thinkers and indicated by Ludwig van Beethoven's inclusion of words, of sound messages, in his last symphony, and emphatically uh, exemplified in the work of Richard Wagner, in the work of Richard Wagner, who considered his operas extensions of the symphony 
and not only wrote them in rhetoric and scores, but also staged them with the decor, costumes, and lighting. The striving for achieving a design concept, a total workaround, still motivated by Arnold Schoenberg and Vasily Kandinsky at the beginning of the 20th century and passed on to quite a few filmmakers. The Romantics also developed a new historical consciousness and saw a period dominated by shared values, beliefs, and tastes, and showed by a spirit of the age, a zeitgeist. The concept associated with the philosopher Friedrich Hegel. The 19th century created great historical narratives, and as we have already heard, the new academic disciplines studying literature, the visual arts, and music were originally conceived as historical disciplines. Somewhat earlier, another concept had arisen which had profound consequences for the study of literature. It was the idea that speakers of one language were all imbued with a Volkskreis, a spirit of the people, or freely translated a national character, a concept that was used to promote, promote the striving for national unity in a Europe and especially in Germany, still divided into many independent principalities. The idea that a people's spirit was most uniquely embodied embodied in its language, and that the highest expression of that language was found in any people's poetry or literature, supported the concept of a national literature with its own unique character. The study of literature, based on the pre-existing model of classical theology, was therefore everywhere instituted first as the study of one's own national literature, later followed by departments for the study of foreign literatures in the world. This compartmentalization has endured until our day. From the end of the 19th century, efforts were made in some places to create departments or programs of comparative literature. Um, to study not literature as such, but the interrelations among national literatures. There was not much continuity in these efforts until the end of World War II, but as we shall hear, it was primarily by literary comparatives that studies and the interrelations of the arts were developed as part of their understanding of their own field of studies. But the appearance of Malta's mutual illumination of the arts did not start a train. Its most direct successor appeared 40 years later in the United States. Yeah. Why decide as much as made four stages of Renaissance style in 1955? The first three decades of the 20th century were marked by all kinds of artistic <laughs> collaborations in the formations of schools and movements and the elaboration of manifestos in new genres such as the Nicolette East or Arthur's book, or in the staging of avant-garde performances. There was an unusually large number of multi-talented artists and writers, and new forms of artistic production such as collage and montage were imitated in the old arts and the new, such as photography and film. But at Walter's time, academic studies did not deal with contemporary production, and thus were not affected by these trends. And the older tendencies towards the purity of an art, of an art form to become truly itself, was paralleled in literary scholarship by a tendency to concentrate on the poem itself, in such trends as the new criticism, the shift in literary studies from a historical to a critical orientation. The highly influential theory of literature by René Bennett and Austin Warren, first published in 1949, while emphasizing the necessary interplay of theory, history, and criticism, distinguished between the extrinsic and the intrinsic study of literature, extolling the latter and relegating the study of literature and the other arts to the non essential and questionable form. But by 1949, the scene had changed considerably. During the 1920s and 30s, 
publications concerning any aspect of the compatibility of the arts had been relatively rare. The most important was probably Kurtweiss. Yeah. Kurtweiss is the symbiose der Künste, Forschungsgrundlagen zur Wechselbewegung von Dichtung, Bildung und Vorkommens, Symbiosis of the Arts, Foundations for Researching the Mutual Contents of Poetry, the Visual Arts and Music of 1937. But there was obviously enough interest and activity in the United States that in 1940, members of the Modern Language Association created the Division of Literature and Other Arts, General Topics 9 of the MLA. One of its most active members was Calvin S. Brown, who in 1948 published his pioneering music and literature, The Comparison of the Arts. The 40s saw the publication of several weighty tomes on La Correspondance des Arts, which is the title of the book by Etienne Souriau, or The Arts and Their Interrelations, a book by Thomas Munro, approaching the subject from various angles and with different methods. In response to the increasing number of scholarly publications on comparative aspects of the arts, both articles and book length studies, Brown and a team of collaborators began in 1952 to compile an annual international bibliography on the relations of literature and other arts under the auspices of the MLA division. The most influential book published in the 1950s in the United States was Gene Haxton's The Sister Arts, The Tradition of Literary Victorianism from Dry to Gray of 1958. The first book to provide an overview of the discourse on the comparative analysis of text and image from antiquity to the 18th century. The 1940s also witnessed the introduction of courses about the interrelationship of literature and the arts into the American college curriculum, along with the production of a few textbooks on the subject. The syllabi as well as the textbooks, were based on the still prevalent model of a historical orientation exemplified decades earlier by Wolfling and Watson. A privileged space for such courses were comparative literature curricula. In the Anna University, where a comparative literature program had been established in 1948, it was one of the first to offer such a course called Modern Literature and the Arts created in 1954 by Ulrich Bachstein and Horst Hens. I was invited to teach it in 1957. The syllabus I inherited proceeded by exemplifying dominant periods and movements in Western culture from late 18th century neoclassicism via romanticism, realism, impressionism, and symbolism into the 20th century by poems and short narratives, paintings, and instrumental music and in the end also film. On the basis of essentialist notions concerning the nature of these movements, and undoubtedly influenced by the formalist criteria espoused by Valencia, students were instructed about distinguishing features characterizing each movement, and then asked to recognize these from parallel traits exhibited by paintings, literary texts, and musical compositions that were considered to represent these movements. This course was, as originally conceived, was representative of a major tendency in the comparative study of the arts at the time. Although the books by Brown and Haxton, as well as many essays published at the time, indicated a much greater variety of approaches and problems. One essay, Leo Schwitzer's 1955 Critical Republic, of an earlier invitation of John Keats's canonical rule of the Grecian term reintroduced an ancient rhetorical term into the discourse and ekphrasis or ekphrasis has since become a major topic of world and English studies. Several essays were striving for greater theoretical clarity. The nascent field developed by literary scholars and therefore designated for decades as literature and the other arts, was lacking in academic form that might have provided methodological models. 
1961, in the first Tours American Handbook of Comparative Literature, Henry H. H. Weyman offered the field a place where defining comparative literature as, quote, the study of literature beyond the confines of one particular country and the study of the relationship between literature on the one hand and other areas of knowledge and belief, such as the arts, for example, painting, sculpture, architecture, music, on the other. But the new comparative discipline had its own problems of establishing itself side by side with the traditional national literature departments and was slow to accept this broad self-definition, both in the United States and certainly internationally. In 1968, Uri Weishman, Riemann's colleague at Indiana University, included in this Einkloh in die Verkleidung der Naturwissenschaft, the first German language manual for the discipline, an excourse, exercising in a hell of the concept, um, borrowing Balsen's title for, his, for this appendix, which version Mutual Elimination of the Arts. It was not until 1979 that the International Comparative Literature Association sanctioned this subdiscipline by making literature and the other arts one of the three themes of its ninth congress held in Innsbruck, Austria. The special organizers for this section were Weinstein and Stephen Paul Scheer, who had begun publishing on the relations of literature and music and had taken over combining the annual bibliography from Calvin Brown. Computer, uh, contributors to this conference came from many countries, and the proceedings contained uh, 34 papers on literature and the visual arts, 17 on literature and music, 5 on literature and film, and 4 on method theory and methodology in English, French, and German. Weinstein and Scheer also contributed the essays on literature and music and literature and the visual arts to the volume on Interrelations of Literature, edited by Jean-Pierre Baricelli and Joseph Civardi for the NLA in 1982, with Jared Mass writing about literature and film. In 1984, there appeared a collection of significant essays by various hands from different countries, literature of Mosique and Handbooks with theory, Marxist and Scomparticism, Grants to be instead of literature and music, a manual for the theory and practice of a comparatistic border area edited by Scheer. A companion volume edited by Weinstein on the Dragon of Bildekunst, Visual Art, was published in 1992. Both volumes had been stuck with lengthy introductions, in German, of course, and an extensive bibliography. Yes. In 1990, there also 